to this Learning Machines seminar. Today we have Danielle, who is a PhD student at RISE and at uh, the Division of, of Software and Computer Systems at KTH in Stockholm. And the topic today is, is uh, graph representation learning. Uh, so please, Danielle, the floor is yours. And the session yeah. will be recorded. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, let's jump to it. Uh, so I want to start with uh, this, uh, analyzing the fact that we have graph data all around us. Uh, some form of data are naturally represented through graphs, as you see in the screen. For example, social networks or uh, economic relationships networks or uh, more familiar uh, maybe to computer scientists are computer networks or telecommunication networks. Uh, but I want to invite at this point to reflect if we can also uh, model data in our respective domains as graphs, because it also might be possible and it might be a good idea. It might be a good idea, for example, to present an image as uh, interconnected graph or in other domains, other so physical domains or engineering domains, such as handling uh, 3D shapes, uh, for example, for finite, finite element analysis or other physical analysis. Uh, in chemistry domain, as we also saw uh, last week uh, in the presentation in the learning machine seminar, uh, for robot motion planning, uh, or even we can express a simple piece of code as a connected graph of relationships. So these all domains have complex uh, structural relationships among the entities in the graph. So the question at this point is, can we devise a method to exploit those relationships? And uh, if we see the advances in machine learning, particularly in deep learning, they have been developed for uh, fixed uh, grid or somehow fixed structure uh, data, uh, both for images and speech that you see in the screen. But when you see networks, uh, it comes with some challenges. Uh, first, we have arbitrary size networks. For example, in the screen you see on the left, a rather simple graph. On the right, you see one example from 2019 of the internet. Um, we have no fixed ordering uh, of the nodes compared to, for example, an image. I mean, an image has some kind of uh, order Pixel of relationships in a graph, it uh, mostly doesn't matter where you start to analyze the data. And uh, we have dynamicity because the graph can change over time. You see social networks, people get added, people get removed, uh, or either other types of interactions can be created and deleted. Uh, so how, how can we deal uh, with this issue? And the discipline of graph representation learning uh, deals with uh, taking the graph structure data, as you see here on the left, and we try to compute some kind of function to get a feature representation of the entities in the graph. Uh, as an example in the screen, is a node, but you can get a, also a feature representation for the links connected, connecting two vertices to nodes or for the whole graph. And based on, the, based on this feature representation, we can do diverse tasks. We can do node-based classification, uh, as for example, you want to classify some kind of uh, users in a, a social network. You can, you can do link prediction. Uh, maybe you want to predict the relationships between two persons, like when you get friend suggestions in a LinkedIn or uh, other social networks. You can perform graph, graph classification, such as in the example of molecules. Uh, you can perform anomalous detection, clustering, etc. So today we're going to talk about a subset of, of this mapping between the graph structure data to the feature representation. 
Uh, but let's start seeing what has been there before. So um, also we have we have seen before first uh, in the rise of graph kernels, which were used to compare like two graphs. Uh, their similarities or disti distinctions. Then we see node embedding approaches. We have seen node embedding approaches, which are based on probabilistic methods to generate these embeddings. And most, more recently, over the past 10 years, we have seen the rise of these so-called graph neural networks, uh, which also exploits the relationships of the graphs for diverse tasks. And there has been, uh, I would dare to say, an exponential rise in research. Uh, coming from this area. So today in this talk, we are going to focus on graph neural networks. Uh, we're going to see what they are, what types, uh, what types of neural networks they are, and uh, some recent advances, advances uh, advantages, and maybe some also uh, limitations to those. So uh, let's start. So on the screen you see on the left, uh, some kind of known uh, convolutional neural network, CNN, from the deep learning domain. Uh, and on the right, you see like a graph representation data. And on the left, you notice that when, when the convolutions were developed, uh, it's like taking a sliding filter, which, which we put on the image, and we, we a filter with, which we put in the image, and we slide it through, through the image uh, or through, the, through this grid structure. And uh, we compute output for each location of this filter. But this grid is a fixed size grid. So when you see images, all the images have the same size in your training data or in your, in your use case. And uh, yeah, here below is an example of a convolutional neural network. But with graphs, we have a variable size grid. So and this grid uh, might change to time. So how can we design such a sliding filter in this case? Uh, well, the basic approach for all the methods that we are going to see, uh, I'm going to try to explain it here. So on the left, you see an example of a graph uh, with different colors representing the nodes. And in the example of, of graph neural networks, uh, we would try to, to, to perform the, compute, the, the node embedding for node A by exploiting the structure, the topological structure in the neighborhood of node A. So what does that mean? We are going to take the, the node features from the neighbors from A, we are going to somehow uh, receive their messages or their, their node features, and we are going to apply an activation. And that's how we are going to update the information from, from node A. So if you see it, it's like we are building a rooted subtree structure from node A. And uh, in the case of graph neural networks, we should do that uh, for all the nodes in the network. So for each of the nodes, we can build a different subtree structure. Uh, so here is exemplified all the rooted subtree structure up to two hop neighborhoods from this graph. Uh, but it's just for simplification purposes. Uh, when you apply this in, uh, on, on, on training or on a deployment system, you can do these computations also as, as, uh, as matrix multiplication. So it's not like you need to spend a lot of time by uh, developing these rooted subtree structures. So in a nutshell, first, uh, you aggregate your messages from your neighbors, and you perform optionally some kind of transformation of those messages before you receive, you receive them. And then you aggregate the messages and uh, optionally also perform another transformation or a readout function. And the advantage is that uh, these parameters can be shared on the nodes, these gray boxes uh, for each of the subtrees. It's, uh, you only need one of those. And uh, that's the similarity uh, with traditional convolutional networks in which you have, you learn these filters and you can slide them across all the image. Well, in this case, you learn these gray boxes and you can slide them across every node in the graph. And uh, it's optional if you want to go one hop or two hops or as much of uh, hops that you would like to have. Uh, yeah, so again, to recap, we have a node. We can see it as a rooted substrate structure. In this case, we're only going into one hop neighborhood. Uh, we compute a message with some function MSD, uh, which can be different 
forms of uh, of uh, aggregation, well, of uh, of message computation, uh, for example, a multi-layer perceptron. And the second step, we aggregate those messages, for example, through summations or through a mean those activations. Uh, here you see uh, u that belongs to n n of v n of v denotes the neighborhood of node u. And we are trying to perform the computation or the embedding vector for uh, node v. We consider all the neighbors of, of v. And at the end, we perform a nonlinear activation. So how does it look like on the, on, on the formula this all together? Well, you, this is one possible example from one of the most known uh, rough convolutional networks. Uh, first, you aggregate these messages. First, you transform the, the messages from your neighbors. So with this matrix W, or with this multiplication W. And in this case, you are aggregating the messages by a simple summation. At the end, you perform uh, the nonlinear activation, which can be some kind of ReLU or Sigmoid or Softmax or et cetera. Yeah. So uh, now we saw how does one uh, graph convolution, uh, what, 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 what one graph convolution does. And uh, similarly, as in deep learning, we can start stack multiple uh, layers of these convolutions together, depending on the use case that you are observing. Uh, in the first image, you see we are computing like node embeddings for each of the nodes in the graph, and then we kind of perform some kind of specification. But you can also do some kind of uh, readout function and append it with also a multi layer perceptron to perform a graph based classification. So here, vector y represents different uh, classes that you can assign to a graph. Uh, we can do many things. You can do an some kind of uh, encoder decoder architecture as well. And the good news is that uh, things that we are familiar from from other deep learning domains, uh, we can also apply them here. We can perform batch normalizations or dropouts or uh, many more techniques that uh, we are used in deep learning. Uh, so at this point, uh, so along the presentation, uh, I forgot to say if this is if you have any questions with. I think you can you can ask things here. Just interrupt me, or you can wait until the end of the presentation as you like. Uh, but along the presentation, I will be giving some remarks, like important things to keep in mind that I have learned uh, myself in the past months when I have uh, been dealing with these graph neural networks. So first, I ask myself, how do you do this batch training when you have graph networks, right? Uh, and if you see one graph, you can represent this graph and the relationships in the node with an adjacency matrix, uh, which is a, a quadratic uh, matrix, which we uh, see the diagonal. And you have, uh, in this case, you have a binary diagonal, uh, adjacency matrix, which just tells you two nodes to have a relationship. But in case you have weights between the nodes, then the, this, can, this can be some kind of number. Uh, what happens when you have two graphs? For example, here you have a, a, a cycle graph and then a star graph. Well, the way that you patch them together is you can stack them in a block diagonal uh, matrix, uh, adjacency matrix. So your graph would be a compilation of small subgraphs that are not connected, not connected between each other. So if you do this with n graphs, then you, have, you can have a, like a huge, uh, uh, highly sparse matrix in which you perform the batch training on, on this graph. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's look at an overview of, of GNN. I took this slide from a presentation from, from a professor called Xavier Brisson. And uh, he made this interesting observation that uh, so up to 2016 or 2017, uh, there were the methods developed to extending convolutions to graphs. Then we saw another uh, small uh, era in which uh, we can design a better uh, aggregation equations between the nodes. And then the third class is just extending these, uh, these, these lastly developed methods to handle, handle more uh, difficult cases that we would go uh, into those uh, uh, at the later parts in this presentation. So let's start with the first part, uh, what uh, it's called isotropic GMNs. Isotropic is uh, ISO is the same, and tropic is like topological space. So we see all the neighborhoods as the same. So 
So we don't differentiate in the, in between different messages that we receive from our neighbors. And so this is the example that we saw before, that in previous slides. So you have in the layer L, you want to compute the activation from layer L plus one. So you have one uh, transformation for your node. Like if you are the node, you have one transformation from yourself and you apply the same transformation for all your neighbors, right? And examples of these are uh, like chat nets, uh, which use some kind of, uh, they take the graph, then they try, it's, it's based on, I think on spectral graph theory. So they have to compute like the eigenvalue composition and they perform some kind of expansion with the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, you have a graph convolution network uh, from Thomas Kiff, which are like very uh, known in the area, which perform like these mean aggregation here when you see this summation sign. And you have also an example with graph stage, which uh, you can handle different aggregation operations, but the one that resulted with more success in the paper was the uh, max aggregation. And uh, just as a comment, uh, since ChepNet like required that you perform the eigenvalue recomposition, this, this should be also one remark slide. Uh, but since, since the ChepNet requires this eigenvalue recomposition, they are more uh, transductive approaches. What does it mean to be transductive? Meaning, if you have a new graph, then you have performed all the computations again. So the models that you have already trained for one graph uh, are not so generalizable. Whether if you train an inductive approach, you are training sort of like similar to the to the to the conventional uh, convolutional neural networks. You train one function, you learn these weight matrices, and then you can apply it to other graphs as well. Uh, so yeah, what happens when we have large graphs, like million billion node graphs, we have many, many connected edges. Give you an example, uh, social networks, citation networks, any relationships that have many, any, any graphs that have many relationships that, uh, in the nodes. The graph is still somehow sparse, but there are many connections between the nodes. And uh, one possible thing you can do is uh, what the, the authors in graph stage did is that simple simple method uh, instead of looking at all the node activations from your neighborhood you just sample a fixed site of your neighborhood if you don't sample then your space and time complexity is proportional to the number of edges right but if you fix the number of, 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 of nodes that you have considered to perform the activations you are limiting the user space and, and time complexity so on the screen you see fully connected graphs and for the red node in the center you are something in the first hop, you are something only three nodes. And, and for each uh, of the nodes in the second neighborhood, you are sampling maximally, maximal two nodes. So your sub rooted tree structure simplifies to so just consider only some of the nodes. And you repeat this process for all the nodes in the graph. Uh, then we jump into the second category, uh, which is this anisotropic GNNs with that we don't consider all activations from our neighbors to be the same, but we want to weight them. Uh, one option is to use the natural edge features if you have them. For example, if you are handling with molecules, you have, I don't know, you, have, you can consider maybe your the, the, the bond strength between the molecules or, yeah. An example, generation communication networks that are not the latency. Um, where, or the other option is to learn this anisotropy, meaning to learn the weight. So the modification that we apply to the formula that we saw before, remember that HJ are the computations from the neighborhood, HI are the features from the previous activation of our nodes, and we use both to compute the new activations. But the, uh, uh, in contrast to before, we are using this eta function. One example, the most known example is called graph attention network, which computes these, uh, these, uh, these etas as, uh, similar to the traditional uh, attention model in, in, in NLP, which is you first form a query, but doing a nonlinear transform of your nodes. 
then you form you also perform a node linear transform uh, with one of your of the neighbors. You do this for each of your neighbors, and at the end you perform a softmax to uh, scale them all between zero and one, and so that all the activations add up to one. Uh, but this is just one form of doing it. And uh, oh, oh yeah, here on the right you see the difference between isotropic weights that we saw before and anisotropic weights. In the isotropic case, we have the same matrix uh, as activations for all the neighbors. Anisotropic case, you uh, append this uh, or you multiply with this uh, attention weight or weight coefficient. Other examples. Uh, other than rough attention includes uh, somehow something called monads, which are based on uh, mixture models, and gated GCNs, which are based on, on gated recurrent units. Uh, so uh, we come on to the third case, in which uh, let's see some cases where the rough neural networks that we have seen so far cannot do so well or have like difficulties dealing with. And one of those cases is in the graph isomorphism case. Uh, so isomorphism is that two graphs that have uh, look very similar, but in reality, they're the same. So when you, when you change the labels of the nodes, but you still see the, the local neighborhood of each node, it's, in the, it's the same on, on the two graphs. It doesn't matter if you, uh, Change like the the form of the graph, and uh, no, doesn't matter if you change the the ordering of of the the indexes of the nodes. And to determine if two graphs is, is are the same or not, it's generally MP hard. And uh, you might ask, why would I want to observe if two graphs are the same? Well, it turns out I, I did some I, I looked at some applications this this morning. And I found some interesting things like verification of computer programs, logic proofs, uh, or in electronic circuits. You can also do it for fingerprints and retina facial scanner, analysis of social structure, zero knowledge, sorry, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, so it turns out it could be a difficult thing if your graph neural network is limited by this fact. Uh, so what do we want to achieve actually? Uh, we want in a nutshell, that our embedding function uh, takes two different graphs that looks uh, that look different and that recognize that they are the same. Uh, on the contrary, if two graphs look the same but are different, then we want to be able to differentiate them. So this mapping, uh, this embedding function, uh, mathematically speaking, speaking, should be injected. Uh, meaning you can only map them to an instance it's an, uh, an in your image in your image domain. If you're mapping two different elements to the same image domain, then it would not be injective. Um, so yeah, traditional DNNs, the aggregation operations that they have used, are sometimes uh, non-injective. What are the example of, of non-injective cases that we have seen before? I'm sorry. So in the image, you see um, A, B, and C. Uh, each of them look at uh, two different graphs. And uh, the colors relate to some kind of value of the nodes. So if the values of your neighborhoods are the same, so all the nodes in your neighborhoods have the same feature vector, then mean and max operations will fail. So they will give you the same results. Uh, so for two, two different graphs, A, here you can see each graph as a red dot here, we are mapping it to the same element B, right? So we can have, but we can have instances where a mean would not fail, but max would fail, like in the example of B. Uh, if we imagine that node green, it has the maximum value, then you don't care how many red nodes are in your neighborhoods. You can add as many votes, maybe no red neighborhoods as you want. Uh, or in number C, you can see where both fail. And we can develop somehow of, 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 uh, of intuition of these cases. Uh, and as a comment, GCN and graph stage, so the examples we used before, Originally, in the papers, they used uh, mean and max pooling uh, for man, mean and max operations uh, 
min and max aggregation operations, respectively. Uh, so what is the intuition behind this? So if you have these inputs, that's it. So max will only give you some how of, uh, will only focus on, on some specific elements of that set. So advantages, you can reduce noise. Disadvantage is that you can lose a lot of information. If you see a mean, then you can you can get somehow a feeling of a distribution of, of different elements in that set. But the most expressive one is just to consider the multiset. So what is the difference between a set and a multiset? Well, in the multiset, the elements can be repeatable. So they are not unique elements. Uh, and one one of the works that introduced these uh, things uh, is called graph isomorphism networks. And uh, they just perform a sum under the multiset. <laughs> Again, a very simple approach. Uh, so here, but in the aggregations of your function, uh, this function G has to be injective. And how can we prove or how can we ensure that it will be injective? Well, uh, it's in general very difficult to design half-crafted. So <laughs> as, uh, as, uh, as we know from, from this domain, we replaced that with an MLP. And uh, that would allow us more expressiveness. Uh, but uh, as a comment, just until some point, this uh, still the graph, this GIN can, cannot still deal with the, the general, they cannot solve the graph uh, isomorphism problem. But it's an improvement. So two different graphs could be mapped to the same domain. And these spaces, these graph isomorphism, the concepts based on a, on a test called device spider daemon test. And if we have time at the end, maybe we can go through that. And yeah, another remark is that what happens when your node features look very, uh, similar, but you should classify them as two different entities in the network. Like for example, on the left, you see a graph and you see the labels, the target labels A and B for the respective nodes. But assume the case that uh, node V1 and V2 have the same uh, feature vector. So imagine we're just counting how many people are, imagine these are rooms in a building, I don't know. And in, in so this, this building has this structure of one floor and you want to predict how many people are on one room. Uh, no, you want to perform some kind of computation. And uh, in V1 and V2, the only feature you're, you can see is how many people are in the room. So imagine in V1 and V2, there are the same number of people. And the, when you expand these rapid subtrees, then they look exactly the same. So it's very difficult to differentiate those two nodes. Uh, so can we, what, what methods can we apply to kind of break these symmetries? A similar case in, in the node in the graph, in the, graph um, in the right, I think this, this was from a molecule example. You see this carbon and hydrogen, the adjacency. And these nodes, these F nodes, the fluorate uh, atom. So this, this molecule is it's entirely symmetrical with respect to the carbon uh, atom. So one method, one option would be to apply this so-called by fire element able GNNs, but the computation are very expensive. And other approach you could use is to uh, use uh, positional encoding uh, for the nodes. So you append the nodes features with some kind of additional information. Uh, so what kind of positional encodings are there? So you can start very simply by uh, assigning ordered node IDs. Of course, if your graph is symmetrical, then uh, in most cases you will be limited by the symmetry. So there is no canonical form of assigning this, 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 this uh, encoding indexes. Uh, you can uh, additionally perform random node IDs, uh, but there are also two interesting methods that came. That one is based on replication apply, eigenvectors. The other is based on something called anchor nodes. So in a nutshell, the Laplacian encoding, it takes the Laplacian matrix, uh, Laplacian representation of the graph, uh, which is obtained by D, which is a, a diagonal matrix uh, representing the node degree. And so in this case, uh, for the carbon atom, it would have value four. For this hydrogen, you have value three. 
the node degree represents how many neighbors am I connected to for each node. So that is the node degree matrix, and A is the adjacency matrix that we saw before. We perform the replication, the eigenvalue decomposition, if you think about it, and you have to do it do this every time for each new graph. Uh, but you can get these eigenvectors, which you can append to the node features. And, uh, and this would be also some kind of positional encoding. Other works include the concept of some, some, something called anchor nodes. So in the anchor, in the anchor node approach, you select some, you sample some nodes of your topology, uh, or uh, in a subset F that uh, represents like your anchor nodes, and you can you you perform some kind of distance function between the nodes in your graph to these anchor nodes, and you append these distances to to your node features. That's something you could also do to to break the symmetry. And uh, lastly, uh, a remark uh, originating from, from this work that you see in the bottom, they perform some kind of benchmarking between different graph neural networks and uh, using some kind of, of, of fixed budget. And uh, these were their, their conclusion or their contributions, uh, their findings. Uh, so they said that GCNs uh, are able to better both tropic and anisotropic. Uh, leverage basic building blocks of deep learning. So as we mentioned before in, in the presentation. And uh, overall, the anisotropic GCN such as attention and significantly, significantly improves the performance of the isotropic GCN. So those that, so it's always a good idea. It seems that it's always a good idea to, to look at your nodes, neighborhood activations uh, differently. Uh, but yeah, they suggest a further analysis uh, is, uh, is needed, especially in the case of these uh, more advanced graph neural networks that we saw. And yeah, and uh, I want to, in the second part of this presentation, I want to go over some work that we are doing at RISE with, uh, together with uh, Carlos uh, Perez Frances and Timo White. So we are applying, uh, we're trying to apply machine learning for, for carrier scheduling. So in general, my, my, my PhD is about uh, applying machine learning for solving combinatorial optimization problems. And in this case, we're going to look at the case for of, of carrier scheduling. Uh, before we jump into the subjects, uh, we are looking at IoT and networks. And uh, IoT networks is uh, somehow this concept of connecting the devices and, and to exploit more information at different layers, not, not just that it's so centralized. And uh, we are looking at the case in which the IoT layer can have some sensors in them. We measure some values with these sensors. And the notations we are going to use um, on the further slides uh, is uh, we are going to label the IoT nodes as, with A, and we are going to label the tags with T. So the tax, the sensor tax can be like temperature sensor, humidity sensor, or some kind of, but measure some kind of value. Uh, we're looking at the case of battery free sensor tax. And uh, in the case of battery free sensor tax, these tax, these sensors need an external carrier for them to communicate with their hosted node, with their hosting node. Uh, so in this case, this C node is also a node in the IoT network, it's an IoT node that is providing a carrier temporarily to these uh, receiver nodes for them to be able to communicate with their tags in the proximity of this, uh, of the dashed circle. So tags are in the immediate proximity of the IoT node, so the distance between the carrier or between an IoT node and another IoT node is significantly larger than the distance between the tags. So the distance between the tags, I think in practice is like 10 centimeters or something like that. Uh, one node can host several tags and uh, the schedule is composed of cycles. So according to the time division multiplexing uh, axis and for each cycle, uh, a node can only interrogate one of its hosted tags. So if we look at the example of this graph, uh, you see that uh, node A3 has two tags, and uh, the algorithm that was proposed uh, last year by uh, by the authors here in reference one 
it's uh, able to compute this cycle, which exploits uh, somehow the, the information of the fact that A3 has the most tags and it assigns a carrier to A2, uh, so that uh, when in the cycle one a carrier is assigned to node A2, then in the tags A1 and A3 are able to be interrogated. Uh, then in cycle two, we can either assign a carrier to A1 to interrogate the nodes in A2 and A3. So the objective, uh, what, what, is, what is actually the problem is that the constraint over takes prohibitively long time to compute for large problem instances. And the heuristic uh, proposed in the references below is uh, something some suboptimal when the topology increases. So and uh, with this image on the right, also from, from the paper in reference uh, one, I think, is uh, the fact that there are, there are many ways to compute this schedule. So one option is to perform this, or the worst case would be to perform this sequential schedule in which for each cycle, we just look at one tag and we see, okay, where can I assign a carrier, right? So the number of, of cycles would be equivalent to the number of, care, of tags in the network. And, and here on the right is the optimized schedule where it reduces the number of cycles from three to two. Uh, so there are, and, and just as, as this is one, one case in this topology, if, if the topology size increases, there are multiple solutions that are feasible for, for one topology. Uh, so the goal is to devise a machine learning scheduler uh, for these battery sensor tags that either shortens the return time of the existing solution or that can deliver more optimal times on this existing solution as well. So what are the challenges? Uh, well, we have uh, variable graph sizes, uh, which alters the inputs of the system. Uh, both, even if you fix the number of IoT nodes, or the number of nodes A, if you change the number of stacks, and you are subsequently changing the properties of the graph. And uh, we have also variable scheduling cycle sizes. So that alters the output of our system. So here you see in the screen two different examples of two different IoT, uh, of two different IoT networks with two tracks attached to them and two different solutions proposed by the algorithms below. Uh, so our approach, what we are working right now, is to uh, be able to de design this machine learning schedule system that is going to be able to give us information from, from a cycle. Uh, in this case, the cycles uh, are permutation invariant. It doesn't matter if you start, uh, or in this case, it doesn't matter if you start here. Uh, most times it doesn't matter if you start from cycle two or cycle one, because if you're using the whole tag information in the topology, then it doesn't matter. So this, this ordering of the cycle is not important. Uh, so yeah, we do one part over the schedule here. We update the tags for node information. And we repeat this process until no more tags are processed in the net. And well, for the machine learning scheduler, we are using, uh, we're currently using cross neural networks because uh, these are a method that we can exploit the intrinsic relationships in the topology uh, to compute these activations. And uh, yeah, I think that's it uh, from my side. And uh, thank you very much for for your attention and please, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Thank you, Daniel. So do we have questions for Daniel? So I have a question, can you hear me? Yes. Great, so one question in your literature study, did you see any, any Sonia? <laughs> Sorry, my daughter is. <laughs> uh, did you see any any comparison between having shared weights over the layers or not sharing the weights over the layers? So essentially, the difference between having a think of it as a recursive or a recurrent neural networks in the let's say message propagation uh, direction, Hello. or not having a a uh, recurrent neural network. Yeah, I, I think if I understood correctly the question, if we look at these graphs that I'm pointing to right now, so yep. these GCONF that are the same uh, the same activations, right? Over and uh, over. Right, 
the same weights. Compar compared to having different weights. Um, I didn't explicitly look into that, but I recall seeing some studies that when you use these fixed activations, uh, so when you, when you reuse these weight factors, uh, you are, the, the network tends to assign similar, uh, similar feature vectors to all your nodes. So uh, in, the, in, in the theoretical study, they explain it as they converge to a fixed point, all the nodes in the network. Uh, more easily, so it's it's not here the case with uh, so and and if you use different activation functions, I think you can leverage like this fact of conventional uh, CNNs uh, of conventional convolutional neural networks, in which in each layer you are uh, looking at different aspects of the network and you are propagating this information. Yeah. Thank you. So you were also mentioning a, a, a benchmark paper where the conclusion was that anisotropic JCNs uh, in general are, are the better choice. Yeah. Um, is, is that for, for any task or what tasks did they include here and how much better is it to choose these, uh, these models with attention or gating? Well, they perform their uh, their benchmark, uh, as I said, using a, like a fixed budget, and they analyze the different data sets from like MNIST, like this simple image classification, to citation networks, or there's also like one database popular in, in graph neural network papers called the Reddit, uh, Reddit network, and they perform those, uh, those activations there. And see if I may open up this different. Uh, so this here's the paper. Uh, but let's see, I think it was like five to ten percent better. Yeah, for example, here you see for no certification test, and you see the standard graph convolution, the test accuracy was like 63 and the gated GCNs. Was, could, it, could achieve like 86%. So that's a significant improvement. Uh, graph classification tasks uh, also have about 7, 7 to 10% improvement over isotropic uh, network. Yeah. Interesting. You see these uh, anisotropic cases are. Uh, predominantly highlighted in, in achieving better performance. Thank you. Do we have some more questions for Daniel? So otherwise, thank you, Daniel, for the presentation. And um, see you all next week. Same time, same place. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Donnell. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.